My name is Josh Humbert, and I wrote the following talk for a presentation that I gave in Hong Kong uh, last month. And uh, I was invited there to speak at the first um, Sustainable Pearls Forum. It was the first time I ever gave a public speech, and for reasons that I'll soon explain, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, so instead of rehash this talk, uh, I've left it large, largely uh, as I wrote it, and um, I hope you come away with a deeper understanding of how you can affect change in the world simply by asking where your pearl comes from. So, 43 years ago, my French father and American mother built a sailboat out of cement, chicken wire, and rebar. Oh, that's my mom, obviously, right? Um, so with me, my, my brother, two cats, two dogs, and $300, we sailed away from America in search of adventure. Wow. And adventure is what we found. What year was that? Um, that would have been 19... Uh, I was newborn, so 71. 71? Yeah. Um, that, that year we landed in the Sea of Cortez, Mexico. Yeah, so I, I picked up a smattering of French, uh, English, and Spanish. Um, and in 1973, we pulled anchor and headed off for Tahiti. Is that what it looked like when it was done? Yeah. It's such a real yeah. boat. Yeah. Wow. Gorgeous. That's the boat. And that's my dad, standing like this. This is very much my dad. Uh, on the way there, we stopped, uh, lived in the Marquesas for a while, and then uh, in Ahe. In Ahe, we became close with the locals as my father helped them to sell their fish in Tahiti. He gutted our sailboat and Jerry rigged a, a the cabin into a walk-in freezer. Just imagine that, what, wow. what you've known as your, your house, you all of a sudden just go, no, that's not our house anymore. You rip everything out and turn it into a big walk-in freezer. <laughs> that's very much my dad too, it's kind of all in. <laughs> so we, we built the house there. We, we built the house and I, I spent my days fishing and running wild with the local kids in the village. <laughs> <laughs> spearfishing. Yeah. <laughs> Started early. This is yeah, early spearfishing. Very early. Shallow pond. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in the in the house that, that we lived in, uh, we um, the the floor was made of sand, and we all slept in the loft, all on a big bed together. And we had a cat that would catch fish in these in these shallow pools and uh, bring the fish up into the bed. <laughs> 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 One of my earlier memories. So I learned new words in Tahitian and the local dialect Pomotu to add to English, French, Spanish, and Marquesian. That meant that I was now processing six different languages. Years later, I was to learn that the language overload was the, was the cause of my speech disorder. I stuttered. Funny thing in Hong Kong, when I got to that part, the audience burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's funny anyway. <laughs> um, and when I wrote this, I wrote, I battle stuttering every day, and it was, it was meant to be, um, uh, I mean, what seemed truthful at the time. And then I've realized since I had the speech in Hong Kong that I don't battle it every day, and that uh, I feel like um, it's, been, uh, it's been really good and therapeutic for me. Aww. So, I've been attacked by sharks, I've been nearly drowned, I've, I've had bones broken by crushing waves. <laughs> <laughs> yet, yet nothing shook my confidence like the thought of standing in front of a room full of people. <laughs> so when, when my friend uh, Laurent Cartier asked me to, to go to Hong Kong and speak about sustainable pearl farming, my heart started racing when I got the email. And I wondered, are there really enough people that even have a, a conference like that? And, well, I guess there is, so, so I thought I have to do this. And the oysters need me to speak for them. <laughs> for the last 23 years, I've been a pearl farmer. Our family owns Kamoka, and we're passionate about farming sustainably. There are many methods that allow us to positively impact our lagoon environment. We can all positively impact our living environments. Here are two ways in which we can do so. One, use what you have. Two, help the fish and the fish will help you. Use what you have. 
Life on a pearl farm is much like life on a boat. Teamwork, cooperation, and goodwill are crucial for a positive and productive work environment. We achieve this by breaking down traditional roles of employer-employee. Everyone takes a turn at cooking and cleaning, and everyone is trained to do a range of different jobs. Like party. <laughs> <laughs> by fostering cohesion in a family-like atmosphere, we minimize typical pearl farm problems like thievery and toxic work environments. We work together, play together, and share the pearl farm experience as a team. Two things that are abundant on our island are sun and wind. That's where we get our power. Our fresh water is collected from roofs when it rains, and these things lessen our dependency on fossil fuels. Most of our pearl nuclei come from mother of pearl shell, not the freshwater mussels that are traditionally used and are incidentally threatened by overfishing. Independent research uh, that was done on two different occasions in French Polynesia by the Service de, de la Pelicultur, they tested all the different kinds of nuclei because there's actually surprisingly eight different kinds of shell. And one produced significantly higher rates of A-grade pearls, and, and that was our, our own shells. Not just our own shells, but also the shells from the Pinctada Maxima, the, uh, the Australian and, and Filipina silver lip oyster. Um, so that was really exciting to me, but no one seemed to really hear it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we can all positively impact our living environments. Help the fish and the fish will help you. This is the fun part for me. Um, yeah, so the, the work that, that we do helps uh, so many baby fish to get through the, the time in their lives when they're, they're really small and they're the most susceptible to, to predation. The baskets that hold our oysters serve as nurseries for small fish, much the same way that mangrove tree systems do. Here's how we help each other. For any living creature to grow and prosper, it must be able to breathe freely and feed adequately. Ocean currents ensure species distribution, so the vast majority of life in the sea drifts on the currents until coming into contact with a suitable place to live. In much the same way that the bottom of a boat fouls with marine organisms, pearl oysters also become a support structure for whatever <laughs> is looking for a place to settle. Our, our pearl oysters are hung at a depth of about 20 to 30 feet that we think favors food and oxygen uh, for the oysters. What, what better place for an anemone, barnacle, coral, or algae to grow? And what about tiny fish, crabs, shrimp, octopus, and urchins? Since we're talking about ideal growing conditions, why not do it over water deep enough so that the natural predators of these things don't get to them? Left unchecked, it's clear that very quickly, oysters will be struggling for survival as organisms grow on top of organisms in a perpetual struggle for access to food and oxygen delivering clean water. Many farms, and especially the industrial ones, deal with this problem by blasting their oysters with high-pressure water hoses, sending all the organisms back into the water. Most of it sinks to the bottom where it is eaten by fish, but some species, such as anemones and fast-growing sponges, are triggered to reproduce in a massive and artificial way. Uh, in many atolls and islands, this has caused big imbalances that have enabled single species to smother and outcompete in the natural environment outside of pearl farms even. Like Douglas was saying, um, uh, one oyster can travel 170 kilometers from the moment where it was born to the moment where it fixes. So this is also true for just about everything else that, that, uh, that, that lives in, in, in the ocean. Typically drifts with currents and then once it takes on a certain mass it sinks to the bottom. Um, yeah, so so that's no good, right? So one, one day about 20 years ago, we're in the process of routinely cleaning oysters, um, which for, for us at, at the time meant um, bringing them to the farm and manually scraping them. And, and uh, it's just, it's a big, heavy, messy, stinky job. I think Sherry was there to, to see what, what that was all about. And to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's definitely instances in which we, we need to do it. Um, we need to sort of clean the oyster up get the, the last little bits off that the fish don't, don't take care of. But that, that's how we used to clean all of our oysters and the amount of work that it required is just absolutely ridiculous. So anyway, I, I noticed on this one day that, that as the, the day wore on that the oysters were getting cleaner and cleaner. 
And towards the end of the day, there was much, much less work to be done on, on the oysters. And so I had this kind of aha moment, like, wow, the fish are there and they're working for us. Like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so the fish population on the farm had become really robust and they'd become conditioned to come running whenever we brought oysters to the farm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to me, the most fascinating thing about our Pavlov's parrotfish, as I like to call them, um, is that it's not just the parrotfish, it's, it's all the fish. You know, the, the trigger fish run towards the, the shells, the things that are real hard to break on the oyster, the, the butterfly fish with their pointy snouts, they run and pluck off the, the, the anemones and the things in the, in the cracks that are hard to get at. And every fish has a food that corresponds to it. And so instead of the food favoring one species and that species sort of pushing out the others, which is often what happens in situations that are similar. All of the different species were, were getting food and becoming stronger. So what we're seeing is our, our lagoon just starting to, to come alive uh, underneath the farm. Uh, and, uh, and even some, some species like grouper that, that aren't interested in what's growing on oysters, well, they'd be hang, hanging around and uh, occasionally they'd eat a party goer. You know, like, <laughs> and so, so it's very cool and for me heartwarming to see that, that, that what we're doing is actually helping the, the lagoon that, that we work with. But um, as far as like, if we don't clean them, they basically just become completely covered. You know, like I said, it's just organisms on top of organisms to the point where an oyster which is shaped like that will, will just be like this ball. Wow. Um, of things basically trying to, trying to get in its face. And it's, it's like having like things growing on your face. <laughs> so anyway, we, we quick, quickly clued in and, and built these underwater platforms that are sort of sprinkled around uh, near the farm in shallow zones where there's, there's natural populations of, of fish that, uh, that, that already live. Um, so the oysters, they actually grow up in real deep water and then we bring them into these shallow zones where there's a lot of fish and then the, the fish clean them up and then we take them back out to the, to the real clean water where, where they, they grow up much better. You can't leave them in these zones because there's a lot of uh, particulate matter and oysters are filter feeders, they suck everything in no matter what it is. So if, if you have them in a sandy zone like this, they spend a lot of their energy uh, sorting through the, the sand to get at the food that, that they need. So it's important that to not even learn to have them grow over the, the deep, clean water. Yeah, so in our little corner of the atoll, it's easy to see a, a vibrant, healthy ecosystem. So I believe that farming in this way, we can help to restore our lagoons to the state that they were in before people got there. Um, and I think that that's an incredible opportunity that we have as pro farmers. I mean, I don't really, I can't think of any other kind of activity that, that can do that, and, uh, and I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, in, in our zone where, where we farm, we don't fish, and, and we don't let other people fish, and, and so it, it's become a reserve. Um, just like you have all over in all countries, there's, there's certain uh, ocean zones that are, that are des designated as, uh, usually called MPAs, Marine Protected Area. Um, so that's basically what a pearl farm is. It's a marine pr protected area that keeps people from, from harvesting uh, sea life. So the conference that we had in, um, in Hong Kong, it was proof, in my eyes anyway, that the world is, is starting to, uh, to care and, uh, and that there's hope for, for the ocean, really. National Geographic. Yeah, so this is an, an article um, that was in National Geographic. Uh, uh, last year, this is a photo of mine, and there was a group of researchers. Um, one of them, Laurent Cartier, was the guy who invited me to Hong Kong. And so Laurent Cartier and another guy named Kent Carpenter, who is a, a world-renowned uh, fish expert, came to Tahiti and did a research project. So basically, if the buyer cares, the farmers will care. And ultimately, uh, we can all help to change the world, right? Right. <laughs> So that's kind of it. Um, anybody has any questions? Okay. okay, when when a fish do a good preliminary job, but there's still a lot of yeah.
Well, the, the fish. You have to jump off the house. Yeah, the the, basically, the, the, the fish get the oyster to the point where the oyster can can uh, can grow well. But then, for us to work on on the oyster afterwards, that, that's a that's a uh, secondary cleaning. Um, but I was yeah. thinking of some of the other farm, you know, things, the larger farms that are still using the pressure hoses. That's still like their ongoing process between harvests. Is yeah. that correct? It's ongoing. Yeah. Wow. It's your, you're, and you never, it's like what they say about painting the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, yeah, you don't finish one end before you have to go back to the other and start painting again. That's the way oysters. Are yeah. there other farms on all that? Yeah, there's a lot of farms. It's, but you're the only one that does it in this fashion? No, we're not actually. Um, since, uh, since we started, we've been able to uh, just spread the word and there's a, 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 a bunch of farms that, that do it our way. Okay. Um, small, you know, the small yeah. farms. Um, there are farms that use the, the pressure hoses, but through the, the pressure, through the, um, the pressure that, that we've been able to, to put on them through the community, they've, uh, they've relocated their, their washing to, uh, to land, which is good because they, you know, they, they blast them over, over a big pit, a big saltwater pit that's isolated from the lagoon, so all the filing goes into the pit and doesn't get into the water. So, yeah, it was interesting. Um, a lot like what, what Douglas said about, um, uh, you know, there's there's the official way, you know, with the laws and whatnot of doing things, and then there's another way, and um, that that's what we had to do to, to get the uh, the big farms on Ahi to, to stop using the, the pressure hoses. Is um, uh, I uh, made up a petition and I took it around. I had I think uh, 200 signatures on it. Which is a lot for an island of 400 people, right? Just use an X. Is it the other two children? And and it basically it got everybody talking, everybody buzzing, and mm -hmm. and at the at the airport in Ahe, there's a there's a little hut there where everybody drinks beer before they take their flight, and it's kind of like the the, the unofficial town hall, and and, uh, and so people just talk about it, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, we, we have a lot more enemies than than we used to have, and, and these big farms, they have to stop, and everybody kind of got on the same page with that. And, uh, and then the big farms, you know, the, the owners or whatever would show up at the airport drinking their beer, and people would be like, give them you know, stink eye, you know? and, uh, and so they stopped, and uh, it was very, very cool. You know, we, we didn't have to use legal action or whatever, it was just social pressure. What is the highest elevation of high? Uh, about mm, four and a half, maybe five feet. <laughs> yeah, we've 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 been um we've been watching closely and we haven't seen anything yet. But there's been no reduction in land mass over the, that that has been observed over the course of like forty years. Not not that we can see, but um, we're in a different part of the Pacific, and um, and uh, believe it or not, sea level rises are not uniform all over the planet. Oh really? Um, huh. Yeah. Also. Mm -hmm. I actually know what the, where, the, where the levels are rising the most is yeah. because they have these special kinds of tides, and it's a different sort of porous um, coral atoll that we don't have. So what happens in like um, Tokilau and the islands that are sort of disappearing is that um, the tides are actually coming up through the porousness of the atoll, and the water is going over the landmass, and we don't have the same kind of formation in the eye, so we don't have those problems. Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't quite understand how tides work, which is kind of shocking because I am you know, concerned by it. But um, yeah, there's there's fixed tides in French Polynesia, which is really strange. But they don't change every 47 minutes like they do here and like in a lot of places. And do people fish inside the atoll or yeah. as well as outside? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I was really interested in that implement that uh, the guy was using to open the oysters. It was specially manufactured. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? I've okay. never seen that um, before. Well, to open an oyster, um, you you have a metal wedge that you that you um, delicately put in between the, the two valves. Then you pry it open ever so slightly, and then you stick in a, um, a, a spreader spreader plier that um, goes in like that and just. You, know, you clamp on one side and it opens it up, as, you know, as opposed to the other direction, like ordinary pliers. It looks like it was specially manufactured yeah, tool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, that, it, it's made for for pearl farming. So is it you buy it on the internet or? Uh, yeah, you yeah, you could. Really? Yep. Yeah. Oh wow. 
But that's the, the secret to a, a low mortality rate is working in the smallest yeah. possible mm -hmm. space. It looks kind of like a clothespin that you cut in half or you pry it. A lot of them, yeah, are clothespins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Plastic clothespins. Right. Yeah. Sustainable. So how long can you have mountain water when you're doing the... Uh, because it looks um, like you had a whole basket of them. So yeah, adult, I mean, they're, they're, um, <coughs> They're, you know, they're mollusks, so they, they can handle being out of the water for quite some time. Um, and actually, the smaller they are, the, the longer they can handle it. We, um, we were, were pioneers in um, transporting uh, baby oysters. Um, we would actually send them uh, from Ahe to a farm that we started uh, on the island of Raiatea, and they'd be out of the water for like almost two days. And we, we, we'd put them in a cooler and we'd, we'd fill it up really, really full so that uh, just oysters and we'd shake it and get them all settled so that just the weight would keep them all closed and then they'd go in, in a refrigerator which would lower their metabolism uh -huh. and uh, they'd be fine almost two days later. There'd be a little bit of mortality but for the most part almost all of them were fine. Did you happen to bring the blue pill? The, the blue pill? No, and no, I, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a lot like Viagra so. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'll bring it out a little later for, for show and tell. There are some people here that probably don't know the story of the yeah. heart of the lagoon. You want to tell that? Is that um, after lunch? No, I want you to talk. You want me to tell? Okay. Okay. Show and tell. Do you get? Do you and other farms get help from like the, the equivalent of the Small Business Administration or marketing cooperatives? No, no, we're totally yeah. on our own. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Um, Douglas was saying that he had 99%, yeah. um, you know, funding from the pearls that everybody's buying. I'm thinking, wow, that's great. You have 1% that's not from that? <laughs> My mom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I need a wealthier mother. What is the largest size pearl your farm has produced so far? Um, uh, one tenth of a millimeter shy of 20, so 19.9. Wow. Yeah, that was a heartbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the nucleus size? Um, I it think, must be so I think in that one we probably, yeah, we probably had a, a 15 millimeter nucleus. Like wow. Yeah. Wow. What color was that one? Uh, it was dark. It was dark and gorgeous. Yeah, it was surprising. Yeah. Where does that one live? I don't even know, actually. Yeah. You sure. sold it? Yeah. Would that have been a third graft? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <coughs> Once you open the oyster, got it open to put the nucleus in, what's the time period for that you can keep that shell open? Is that a much shorter time window than keeping them in a cooler closed? Um, they dry out or? Yeah, but basically, you know, you always want to get them in and out as quickly as possible. You don't want to, you know, have your oysters sitting around in, in the air. Um, uh, a, a rack of oysters like that, the, the technician will go through in, in about 20 minutes. So that's, that's uh, plenty fast enough. I mean, the same oyster can, uh, you know, can, can be out of the water for a day, no, no problem. But uh, yeah, we, in the past we've had uh, kittens on the farm that, that will uh, stick their paws in, into opened oysters and, and the oyster clamps down on them. <laughs> it can be pretty funny. Uh, I, I I don't know actually. I, I uh, well we we um we used to produce quite a few. We we um we were seeding uh close to two hundred and fifty thousand oysters at one point per year. Um and we're getting over half of that in pearls. Um but now we uh we are down to uh maybe about one percent of that. So why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Um, because we can't sell our pearls uh, the way that we need to sell them. I mean, basically, a, a farm a farm can't sell pearls one one pearl at a time. A, pearl, a farm has to sell a whole lot to one buyer that can come and, and pay proper cash um, so that the farm can keep functioning. Um, you know, we're working hard to sell pearls on the website, and and uh, that's. That's not not nearly 
what we need to sustain the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, did I answer your question? Not really. Are your parents still? You weren't home? making enough money to keep that production going. Yeah. yeah. So you said it used to be two hundred fifty thousand. You made about one hundred twenty-five thousand, but it's one percent of that. Um, yeah, I mean we. I mean this. This past year, we, we will have seeded, uh, I don't know, maybe 3,000 oysters. So, so maybe, maybe less, I'm not sure. I'm not up on the numbers. Are your parents still active on the farm? Uh, my, my father retired in, um, in about 2001 and sold the shares of, the majority of the shares of the company to me. And then he actually came out of retirement when we moved to, to Portland about four years ago. So he's on the farm and he's he's uh, out there working hard. <laughs> and your mom? She's in uh, in California. Oh. Yeah, they've been separated. Okay, so that great great lady in the later part was it your mom there? She was working with the pearls. There was an older. That was lady. my that was my dad. With his, with that his was pearls. your dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so good looking. Wow. I thought it was a woman. <laughs> Any other last questions before we move on to the next one? Um, well, one of the things that's come up on ProGuide recently is that there's a lack of trained technicians to do the nucleating. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are a trained technician. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you would kind of address that a little bit. And I, know, you I, learned I, I don't think that's true. I don't agree with that at all. Oh, you don't? Oh, no, okay. There's a lot of trained te technicians that would love to have the work. Oh, but there isn't the money to pay the technicians. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, How did you learn your trade? Uh, I I, uh, I I basically became friends with um, some uh, some Japanese technicians that, that were working on, on the other farms, and this is back um, in '92 '93 when there were no locals that were seeding practically, um, and so I'd take these young Japanese guys, I'd take them fishing, take them spear fishing, crawling for tuna or whatever, and then I'd be like, hey, you think you could uh, <laughs> show me what's going on in there? And, and they were very gracious and helped me, and I was able to. To start with that, and then do my own research and build build from there. Well, hopefully, uh, we can uh, start with those blue pills and start. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about something. Yeah. But it's too early to you know really discuss it. But anyway, Josh, get that done.